Do you think it's possible for a nation of 1,500 people in the middle of the Pacific to be 100% solar powered? When we were asked that question, we said, sure, why not? And that was the beginning of a journey of a lifetime for Charlotte and me. Last year, my company took on a project to bring solar power to Tokelau. Tokelau is three small atolls about 500 kilometers north of Samoa <clears throat> and only accessible by boat. This presented a huge logistical challenge. We realized that the only way to get the job done in a timely manner and to budget was to actually go live there for half a year. I wasn't keen on Dean being away for that long, especially since our twin daughters, Gwyneth and Autumn, were only just over a year old at the time. So we made the decision that the whole family would make the move. Dean's business partner and good friend Shane Robinson and his wife, Jo, made the same decision for their family as their son, Zach, was only six months old at the time. And I remember during the period of time we were in Tokelau, we would receive links to news articles and TV shows or TV interviews from our friends and colleagues back home. We even had an email from my dad one evening who was shocked to have heard Shane's voice on the six o'clock news in Canada. And I remember looking at the project through the lens of the media and thinking, or just really noticing the dichotomy between the glamour of the concept and the reality of making it happen. The Tokelau Renewable Energy Project was an ambitious plan to replace the diesel consumption of Tokelau with renewable energy sources available locally. Apart from mitigating the obvious ecological risks uh, associated with bringing in diesel fuel, Tokelau could also realize an economic benefit due to the massive bills associated with bringing about 1,500 barrels of diesel fuel every year. But what are the local energy sources available to a few small atolls with a combined land mass of only 10 square kilometers and max elevation of five meters? Wind energy? Abundant, yes, but requires significant maintenance. Biofuel from coconut oil? It's a lot of coconuts, not enough. And then there's solar power. Well, the tropics have a lot of, enough of that. And the price of the technology had come down so much in recent years that it really was the practical choice. So the project fell onto us, sitting at our cushy desks in New Zealand, thinking, how are we actually going to do this? <laughs> and at that point, I was still going, where exactly is Tokelau? <laughs> and like, is the drinking water safe? And what happens in a medical emergency? Well, I came to learn that it's impossible to fly to Tokelau. So in the case of a medical emergency, a boat has to be dispatched from Samoa. And if the seas are favorable, it takes 24 hours just to get there. And then, of course, it's 24 hours back again. And I said to Dean, where am I taking my babies? But then, took allowance have babies too, right? So, like, what's my problem? Anyhow, to mitigate our perceived risks, we took as much into our own hands as possible. We knew that there was a fortnightly supply and passenger <laughs> boat that went from Samoa to Tokelau and back again and brought the staples, but not much in the way of fresh food. And the coral rubble that makes up the atolls can support, of course, coconut palms and breadfruit trees, but not much in the way of, say, vegetable gardens. So we bought dried and canned goods and shipped it up with the project gear, along with a plethora of medical and first aid supplies. Shipping the equipment for the project was the largest consolidated shipment to ever land on the three atolls. <laughs> we chartered an entire cargo vessel out of Auckland to carry all 1,000 cubic meters of our equipment. That's not that impressive in freight terms until you understand how freight is handled on Tokelau. <laughs> you see, there are no ports on Tokelau, so you can't use standard shipping containers. Each atoll has a channel that's been blasted through the reef by the New Zealand Army. Small barges go out and meet the cargo vessel in open water so that pallets and crates can be offloaded. And then that barge must navigate back through that narrow reef pass through breaking swell to get to the jetty. On the morning of our terribly early boat departure from Samoa to Tokelau, the team was rather silent and introspective, likely contemplating the 30-hour boat journey we had ahead of us that was to leave us off somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. We had um, Phil, our engineer from Australia, Thomas and Hadley, our electricians from New Zealand, 
our family and Shane and Joe's family. And we all lined up, passports in hand, dutifully, ready to board the rusty bobbing cork known as the Lady Naomi. <laughs> the seasickness did nothing to alleviate my feelings of nervousness and anticipation about the trip. And when the baby started vomiting and the dehydration became visible, I could feel the anxiety starting to set in. When we first sighted land, I remember being a little bit confused about what we were actually looking at. It really just seemed so small. And then I noticed an island off in the distance in that direction and another one way off in the distance in that direction. And at first I'm thinking, are those the other two atolls? No, that can't be right. And I remember that Google image you see of the circular reef that makes up the atoll. Well, the reef is primarily all underwater and it's only traced by these small islands known as Motu. So even though there is a <coughs> lagoon in the middle of that reef, it really just feels like the continuation of open ocean with these sporadic little islands. Anyway, when we set foot on solid land finally, our team made its way over to the project site to assess the situation. The foundations for the solar arrays were half in a swamp and there was debris scattered all over the place. The buildings to house our batteries and control equipment wasn't ready yet. And the equipment we'd shipped up from New Zealand was still on another Motu. And oh man, the heat. The first 10 minutes of physical labor I did outside, I was, got dizzy and had to sit under a tree in the shade for about 20 minutes to recuperate. The heat really took its toll on my body throughout the course of the project. I was often compared to uh, Tom Hanks from the movie Castaway. <laughs> I'd worked in some remote places on the planet before, but I'd never had to deal with such extreme heat and humidity, nor had I ever taken on a project of the scale before. Those two factors really told me right then and there that we had a huge undertaking ahead of us to get this project done in time. Yeah, and that first month was an especially difficult time for the whole team as illness set in. Influenza coupled with diarrhea really took its toll and after a while we stopped putting nappies on the babies because it was easier to clean up the floor than to change them constantly. So the constant diarrhea coupled with the constant sweating meant that keeping them hydrated became a full-time task for Joe and I. And then of course the adults took their turns getting taken down with the gastro bugs and the flu and so between taking care of the babies and ourselves and keeping the team fed and, and with enough cooled boiled water to drink. It was a little bit of a domestic hell, really. <laughs> um, and for me personally, the biggest hurdle was in those first few days when I had to figure out a way to get a grip on that almost disabling anxiety that had started on the boat and by that point had taken a firm hold. <clears throat> and my first few days on the atoll, I was being pulled in different directions. I really need to get my head stuck into the project, but at the same time, I had two sick little girls and a wife that I was worried to death about them. I was torn between my family and the project. I knew that I needed everyone to be happy with their new surroundings in order for our time there to be successful. And I knew this. I knew that I had to find a way to get a grip on this anxiety and I was therefore desperate for some perspective on how to do this. And I remember on the afternoon of that second day there, I got myself out of bed in a cloud of guilt that I wasn't helping unload the crates and tend to the crying babies. And I went outside to take a look around. And I met one of our new Tokelawa neighbors. And she said to me, how are you doing? And in order not to burst into tears, I didn't actually respond to her. And she very gently laid her hand on my arm and looked me in the eye and said, it's hard, isn't it? And then I realized I wasn't so alone. And anyway, that coupled with a phone call to my mother or a Skype call to my mother helped me identify that the root of my anxiety was, was around the fear for my children being so ill in such an isolated place, but that we actually did possess the tools to care for them. So these two realizations together helped me overcome that anxiety and at least become a functional team member again. So, we had survived the first month. <laughs> but we still weren't even halfway through the installation on Fakoofo, the first atoll. We still had two more atolls ahead of us with similar sized installations. After acclimatizing and learning some of the Tokelauan customs, it was actually really neat um, 
or really a lot easier to feel like we were part of the community. And it was really cool to be adopted. Our neighbors would bring us treats like fried breadfruit chips and all varieties of fish. And they would take us out to different motu on weekend adventures to try the delicacies like coconut crabs. Um, domestic duties were still all consuming for Joe and I, but at least by that point we developed our routines. And Joe had even taken on the task of being project photographer. And at that point, I was ready to get involved and give something back to this amazing community who was supporting us. And my opportunity came one evening when I met a new teacher friend in the road. And she was almost in tears and she said to me, Charlotte, my students won't study. I don't know how to motivate them anymore. And I said, oh, well, um, I've got a scientific background and I've worked in water quality before. You know, could I be useful? Maybe I could talk to them about water or careers or something. <laughs> and Anyhow, before long, we had a committee of the public health officials and our high school students, and together we conducted the first ever drinking water risk assessment for Tokelau. And to have those teenagers say to me while we were doing it, you know, I really, I really do want to be, I really want to help make Tokelau a better place to live, was one of the more amazing things I've ever been involved with. We had a similar situation on the project site. <clears throat> um, you see, part of, one of the main aspects of the installation was to work alongside the Toke Allowance to install the solar panels. Too many projects in remote communities have failed because outside contractors come in, they install some new equipment, and then they simply leave. So we work closely with the energy department and the local village workers to train them as we work together to construct the systems. But it was getting to know each other on a personal level that was key to establishing the trust between us. We we're from different cultures, so we had to learn to understand each other. So often in the evenings after work, we would drink our legal quota of beer together. <laughs> or in the case of Atafu, where imported alcohol is banned, we drink the local brew, um, Kalive, which is uh, essentially just fermented coconut sap. And uh, we did a lot of fishing together as well. Yeah, fishing's a way of life there. And on days when a community fish day would be proclaimed, Dean and Shane would lose most of their workers. But it was neat for us because we were always included when the fish at the end of the day was divided up and distributed. And we'd sometimes be down at the seashore during the day and I'd have the babies down there and we'd watch the boats coming through the reef after a day on the open ocean fishing. And one of the men would wave and reach down into the boat and throw a tuna onto the beach for us. <laughs> The, uh, the Tokelauans are, are also known for catching flying fish. You may be thinking, how do you actually catch a flying fish? Well, I can tell you it's not with a line and a lure. It involves wearing a hard hat with this big high-powered torch bolted to the top of it, and it's hardwired to a uh, car battery in the bottom of the boat, and you're holding this unwieldy three-meter-long pole with a net on the end, all while trying to balance on the nose of a tinny, cruising the open ocean at the middle, in the middle of the night. And at first I'm thinking, are we catching the fish out of the air? But, no, flying fish actually swim really close to the surface, and so you just kind of scoop them up. But occasionally, you do catch them out of the air inadvertently, as I'd learned firsthand. Um, it was my turn with the net and the light one night, and I'm sitting on the front of the boat, and this flying fish pops out of a wave, and he's flying right for me. And so I tried to duck out of the way and get the net out in front of him, but that fish feared the same way and got me right in the chest. <laughs> my uh, Tokelau and fishing companions just about fell out of the boat. They were laughing so hard. <laughs> You know, what could I do? Just laugh along with them. But it was moments like these that really laid the foundations for our personal relationships, which were so key in helping us overcome the isolation, and in turn helped the Tokelauans realize their dream of being 100% solar powered. Yeah, the Tokelauans were fiercely proud of their solar power. The celebration after the, ins the installation on Atafu, the third atoll, really brought it home that this was their dream that they had built and we had merely brought it to them. And for us, we went home with memories and an experience that we'll never forget. Thank, Thank you. you.